Greetings, I'm Dr. Ken Hildebrandt. We're here with Professor Noam Chomsky of MIT, the world's most quoted living author. And the reason why I bring that up is because how many times have you seen him on corporate television with all these corporate programs we have on TV all the time? Well, I haven't seen him on there very often. Then again, I don't watch TV too much. So what I want to talk about today, Noam, is the myth of the liberal media that you have CNN and MSNBC on the one hand and, and, and Fox News on the other hand, and, and people don't really realize that. Uh, well, I want you to go ahead and, and you tell us what, what you think about the, the liberal media. Well, my good friend and co-author, uh, Edward Herman, uh, has a book called The Myth of the Liberal Media in which mm -hmm. he exposes the liberal media dissects them and so on. Actually, I mean, I agree with his analysis, but I don't entirely agree with his conclusion. I think those are the liberal media. If you look at the spectrum of permissible discussion in the United States, it's pretty narrow. That's but important, it, yeah. But it goes from what's called conservative to liberal, and that's the liberal media. The liberal media are uh, deep in the pockets of the corporate sector, uh, very closely linked to the government. They, they're sometimes mildly critical. They regard themselves as very uh, uh, independent and uh, adversarial and so on. I mean, I've heard uh, uh, media leaders talking proudly about how they stand up courageously against power and so on, and are tribunes of the people, and I think they really believe it. Uh, but if you look at what they're doing, it uh, conforms very closely to the uh, uh, to the uh, structure of the path to what the demands of the system of concentrated power. Right. In fact, if you go to journalism schools, uh, most of them uh, teach a concept of objectivity. It's very important for journalists to be objective, and they have a definition of objectivity. Uh, if something is agreed by Democrats and Republicans, and you report it, you're being objective. If you question it, you're being biased. But within the spectrum, Democrat, Republican, you're allowed to uh, take a stand in one position or another. But try to get outside that spectrum, and that's a definition of bias. As long as you stay within it, that's a definition of objective. Right. So I agree that these are the liberal media, and that's uh, description of American liberalism. There seems to be a few topics that they just don't discuss fairly. I mean, the, the United States leads the world in, in prisoners and in total number and in prisoners per capita. Um, we have some 800,000 arrests for possession of a plant every year. And meanwhile, some 800,000 kids go missing. Obviously, they would be catching more of these, finding some of them more of the perpetrators that are abducting these kids uh, if they weren't chasing people for possession of a plant. And they're just not, they're not making that real. They're not making real that we could use hemp seed oil to satisfy a great deal of our energy needs right now. Well, here we are right after the tsunami in Japan. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, elections. Uh, the, neither side is really being fair about those. They're limiting us to, to true choices. So we have the, the, the hemp and the, the cannabis and the elections. Well, you know, all of these are examples of how the media are being objective in their technical sense. They're staying within the framework of uh, the Republican Democratic agreement. Uh, so we have, you know, when you say two candidates, even that's misleading. We basically have one candidate, uh, a business candidate. The only question is, uh, which of the business candidates can you, are we going to get? So take, say, the 2008 election, which was supposed to represent a wide spectrum, uh, won by right. Obama. Uh, he barely won, and he won at the end because he outspent uh, McCain. Uh, where was he getting the money from? He was getting it from the financial institutions. Right. And they preferred him to McCain. They thought he'd be better for them than McCain was. And there, by now, the basically the core of the economy. Uh, 2007, they had maybe 40% of corporate profit. 
uh, which is pretty harmful for the economy, but you know, very rich for them. In fact, if you take a look at inequality in the United States, it's known to be very high, but what is less recognized is that the inequality is primarily because of the extraordinary concentration of wealth in a fraction of one percent of the population. Right. One tenth of one percent, in fact. Right. Well, that's uh, hedge managers, uh, CEOs of major corporations, mostly financial corporations, and so on. So that's, that's like the core of the economy, right. and hence the core of political power, because the two go along together when elections are basically bought. Anyhow, they preferred Obama. Uh, they poured a lot of money in. Uh, he was able to swing the election. Uh, and they expected to be paid back. Right. And they were. Right. Uh, the first thing Obama had to do was pick an economic team. There were a big economic crisis. Uh, who did he pick? He went to uh, Robert Rubin, you know, the sort of uh, uh, Wall Street uh, uh, guru, you know. And he picked him, him and his men. Uh, right. Lawrence Summers, Timothy Geithner, and others. In fact, what he picked was the people who were pretty much responsible for the crisis. Yeah, and that's... Uh, there were there were other eminent economists, you know, Nobel laureates and so on, who uh, say Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Paul Krugman, and others, uh, yeah. not left, right, and you know, pretty much mainstream, but critical of uh, the behavior of the uh, architects of the economic crisis, the banks and investment firms. They were out totally. Well, that's the beginning of the payback of uh, the financial institutions for having uh, put him into power. And then if you take a look at the policies they came up with, there was a small stimulus, but pretty small, in fact, uh, way below what it should have been, the stimulus. Uh, in fact, the total stimulus is practically flat to zero, because the federal stimulus just about compensated for the decline in spending at the uh, state and local level. So government stimulus was essentially zero, and it was not enough to lift the economy out of the doldrums. Uh, on the other hand, it was a huge bailout for the criminals. The bankers? Yeah, you know, I mean, they're doing fine. They're richer and more powerful than they ever were. In fact, uh, right in the midst of a couple, about a couple of weeks ago, uh, right at the same time that you're reading in the business press that uh, 20% of Americans now qualify for food stamps. Uh, right at that point, the Goldman Sachs, uh, probably the main culprit in the economic crisis and uh, royally bailed out by the taxpayer, uh, they announced quietly uh, a, I think, uh, $17.5 billion compensation package for executives, uh, tripling of the uh, base salary for the CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, and uh, I think a special twelve and a half million dollar gift to him. That's right in the middle of this, and these are people who were just paid up, saved from destruction by the taxpayer. Right. And it's not the first time it happens yeah. over and over. Why do you suppose that the Republicans or the right wing, uh, extreme right wing media criticizes him for this bailout? Well, that's tongue in cheek. You know. They criticize him for everything. They do. Yeah, I mean, if he was uh, walking on the left-hand side of the street, they'd criticize him for that. Well, they even claim that he's a socialist, that oh, yeah, with his health care plan, and really, like, the, the public option was kept off the table completely. Yeah. Over the objection of about almost two-thirds of the population. Unbelievable. He could have pushed it through, but that would mean responding to public concerns. Right. And uh, there's higher concerns, like the insurance industry. Uh, so, in fact, you know, the health care reform maybe improved things a little, but it did not touch the core of the problem. Yeah. The core of the problem is that uh, the U.S. health care system is totally dysfunctional. Yeah. It's about twice the per capita costs of comparable countries, some of the worst outcomes. And if you look at the famous deficit, if we had the same kind of health care system that comparable countries have, there'd be a surplus. Mm. But you can't touch that, because yeah. there you're going back to the financial institutions. Now, they never get enough, of course, so no matter how much they're given, they want more. And the Republicans are basically their flax. I mean, they criticize the bailout, but that's appealing to their base. 
you know, they want to appeal to a base which says the government shouldn't do anything. Uh, of course, they think the government ought to do everything. Uh, it's just like Ronald Reagan. Uh, he appealed to the base saying that government is the problem, not the solution. Right. At the same time, he increased the size of government. The most protectionist president in American history uh, intervened massively in the economy to uh, support uh, wealth and power. You know, and, uh, uh, I mean, like, for example, his Star Wars program, I don't know what he thought. Maybe he was watching movies or something. But it was sold to the business community yeah. just as a gift. Here's another gift uh, from the government for high-tech industry. And uh, uh, it was even sold to allies that way, like Japan and Germany. And uh, so he was a big believer in a powerful interventionist state. But the slogan is, uh, uh, "Government get the government off our backs. Uh, uh, and the Republicans are in a somewhat difficult position, remember. They are the slaves of corporate power, slavish subservience. At the same time, you know, the, the top one-tenth of the one percent of the population is not enough to vote you into office. So they have to deceive So you have people. to somehow get people to follow you. And there are several ways of doing it. One way is to appeal to the uh, Christian right, mm -hmm. which is a substantial element in the country. Right. And if you can appeal to their interests, you know, you say, okay, let's stop abortion or whatever it may be, you pick up a lot of votes. Wouldn't they have done that when they had both houses of Congress and the presidency and the judiciary if they really wanted to stop abortion? The, they have no intention of doing that. I mean, the CEOs don't, I mean, the, the rich and powerful don't care. I mean, their wives and daughters are going to get abortion no matter what the Well, I mean, they've used this as a ploy to get people they on their way, yes. and yet they've had both houses of Congress, and they had the presidency, and they had the judiciary, and they never did anything. Yes, the public doesn't want it. You know, they have a, there's a segment of the public that wants it passionately. Right. And in fact, they're, it, where they're in power, they're introducing it. Like in, I think, South Dakota. Right. They, yeah, they you know, they're they're ramming it yeah. through in one way or another. Right. But, uh, uh, they can't really stop it. It would be unconstitutional, and they also uh, uh, there's a big, you know, uh, uh, a majority, a large majority of women, for example, uh, would be outraged by it. So they can't really push it through, but they can use it as uh, red meat to throw to the constituency. The same with the claim that they're in favor of small government. They claim to be in favor of small government, get the government off our backs, but. Uh, that the financial industries, which are the core of the economy, they're the most heavily subsidized uh, uh, component of the economy. They're yeah. subsidized by uh, this uh, government insurance policy that they get uh, too big to fail. Right. So you make risky investments uh, and transactions, you make a lot of money, you get into trouble and you run to the taxpayer, he bails you out, That's, uh, and you're richer than ever. Uh, they claim to be opposed to that, but they're the strongest ones in favor of it. And you can see it when you get to policy. So when you get to policy, after all, they fail out. It was started by uh, Bush and Paul. And uh, when, you get, when you get to the regulatory system, um, there are some attempts, you know, the Dodd-Frank bill to try to uh, impose some discipline into the regulatory system. But who's trying to kill it? The Republicans. They don't want a regulatory system. The, um, getting back to the, the top one percent of income earners, top I, one tenth of one. Right, I, you're right, and I think that that probably there should be another subcategory at this point, because, um, well, I heard on the news uh, on the on the radio when I was coming through in New Jersey, and this had to do with New Jersey's taxation. And they were saying, well, the, the, you know, the top 1% is paying, like, I forget, it was 41 or 43% of the overall tax. And this is what they throw out to people all the time. They don't throw out to people, how do they make their money? Either Earth's resources or human labor. Now, I mean, that's how else do they get, we're not importing either one of those from Mars. Well, you know, I mean, not everybody is a tax dodger. So somebody pays taxes. And of course, it's going to, the people, the fact that th this figure that they're throwing out is a reflection of the concentration of, in, of, of income. Since income is so radically skewed to the very rich, uh, there's going to be, um, per, you know, they'll pay most of the taxes, naturally. Right. That's a reflection of, the, I mean, even if we had a flat tax, that would be true. If you want to know more about what's going on, 
you read the front page of the New York Times today. Uh, they have a good story for once on uh, General Electric, the biggest corporation in the country. They've got profits uh, bulging out of their pockets. They're paying zero taxes. In fact, they're getting a rebate. Now, Senator Gravel blamed them and, uh, and the Democratic Party for uh, keeping him out of the debates. It was because Gen General Electric owned MSNBC, and it was MSNBC who censored him from the debates. So here you don't hear about a guy who helped end the, the Vietnam War by reading the Pentagon Papers in front of the Senate. So they've really, I mean, people seem so frustrated nowadays. Um, they are. The population is frustrated. I think that's where the Tea Party comes in, but they just, it it's misguided. And they appeal to, uh, you know, they themselves are a small sector of the population, relatively affluent uh, nativists, small town businessmen and so yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, they've been there for a long time, that sector. But by now they have an appeal to a much broader sector that's really angry and frustrated and doesn't know what to do. Uh, so let's take it out on, uh, they hate everything. Hate the Democrats, hate the Republicans, hate the banks, hate the government, uh, hate scientists, uh, whatever it is, we hate it. And that can be mobilized by concentrated power to get their way on what matters. And they're doing it. You know, I, I wrote something uh, recently and I just said that, you know, we have this more prisoners than anybody else. Uh, one of our leading crimes is possession of a plant. Um, I mean, recently I had helicopters flying over my property and the adjacent people, and they got, you know, for they found some people for uh, growing marijuana. And obviously, they weren't growing it on their own property, so who knows who was doing it? But they, I mean, that was an awful expenditure. And uh, you know, the average person thinks, well, what can what can I do? Okay, we could be grow using uh, hemp seed oil, uh, the, you know, to handle a great deal of our energy needs. And we know, the, I mean, gosh, if it can reduce some of these nuclear power plants, wouldn't that be wonderful? And there's, there's these solutions, and they're censored by the media. And I suggested what I think, is when people say we need a revolution, I just find that extremely impractical. I don't think that that's going to happen. And, but an informed revolution, if people could just inform one another and I mean, something has to happen, and we're not on a very good course. I mean, you wrote to me recently saying that it's just surreal. Yeah, we're going off a cliff. And there is, strikingly, there has been the first major reaction. What happened in Wisconsin? Right. In Ohio and Indiana. That was pretty surprising. I mean, in Wisconsin, there were tens of thousands of people on the streets for a long time occupying the state capitol. I mean, they lost in the, legis in the legislature, but they had a they reached, I mean, about probably two-thirds of the population of Wisconsin supported them. Uh, it was rammed through by, you know, the Coach brothers and uh, the governor trying to right. spearhead an attack on the last remaining uh, uh, labor unions. Uh, it had nothing to do with the deficit. But it had to do with uh, the fact that organized labor remains a barrier to complete corporate tyranny. So they want to wipe it out. And uh, unfortunately, Obama's. Did you hear a word from Obama about this? No. Because no. the Democrats more or less supported. Yeah. You know, when in the research from my book, I found that a lot of the candidates, uh, the Democratic candidates, were hogging up the, the PAC money, the corporate money. Look so, at, I mean. If you want to be in the political game yeah. now, you have to. Uh, be in the pocket of the corporations. That's what happens when elections are bought. Right. I mean, uh, since the 70s, the price of winning a seat has just skyrocketed. Yeah. And you can pretty well uh, predict who's going to win just by looking at campaign spending. But that's where I say, like, if, if we could inform people, you know this, is a, we, this is the 10th time we've met up, actually. And, um, you know, I've said that I, my personal opinion is that I think we should go for these third party or independent people who are, I mean, I don't know if there was a big difference between Obama and McCain getting in there. I mean, maybe we would have invaded Iran. I, I, I don't know how much worse it would have been with McCain. So really, but, but, but we keep drawing a line. They keep drawing a line further and further to the right, and we keep going along with them. And, uh, 
Well, because they have the system locked up. They have the system. You can't run an independent candidate. It's almost impossible. For one thing, you need a ton. Either you need a huge amount of popular support. The support to get, effort, right. Well, but, you know, to get effort that. Effort overcome. To, get, you yeah. know, to overcome the concentration of uh, wealth, which is a real job. Right. And you got to work on that. But uh, if not, if you don't have that, then there's no way to run in a campaign unless you're corporate funded. You need the mass effort. And even, you know, even with that, by now the, the uh, elect, uh, Ralph Nader's talked about this, the uh, gerrymandering of electrical, electoral districts yeah. has gone so far that most of them are just locked up. Well, it would have to be a, a completely overwhelming victory. It I would think. really like, have to be overwhelming. Otherwise, it just wouldn't happen. And uh, that requires massive organization. I mean, it seems... In fact, part of the reason for going after the last remaining unions with such a frenzy is that they are the core of the possibility of organizing. So you got to get rid of them. Yeah. Get an atomized population where maybe everybody's frustrated and angry, but they don't know what to do. Well, they were complaining on the radio broadcast I was hearing about, yeah. You know, well, these ones want benefits and this and that, and and you know, I mean, we should. Yeah, everybody had benefits 20 years ago. It's just like the, this wealth is is concentrated up there, and then they keep yeah, having this. They're not complaining with, about the benefits that Goldman Sachs is giving to its executives. Yeah. That you keep quiet about. What you what you focus on is the fact that uh, you know, teachers uh, don't have to starve after they retire. Yeah. Well, that's that's good propaganda. Wow. It could be a better world. Mm -hmm. I just hope that we uh, we start yeah. making some steps in, in that direction. You know, really, you take a look at the Republicans. The Republicans in Congress are interesting in the House. I mean, they're not going to get their will, I don't think it'll be blocked, but it's interesting what they want. So right now, for example, there, you take a look at science, for example. I mean, science and technology are, are the hope for the economy of the future. Forget the benefits. You're not going to have an, a functioning economy if you don't have a lot of science, a science and technology. That's where the modern economy comes from, and it will in the future, too. They want to destroy it. They're cutting back funding on the basic parts of the, on the parts of the government that are right at the core of funding scientific innovation and development and training and so on. They and that's rid of it. and that's another thing with hemp. That's another solution. I mean, here they got us involved in NAFTA and the World Trade Organization. We lost all these jobs. Then they look down on these people who don't have any employment. What are they going to do? I mean, hemp is something else that could also be a shot yeah, in the arm. How, they, how can they withhold solutions? Well, but I mean, take, like, take green technology. Yeah. I mean, if there's going to be a solution to the energy crisis, it's going to be in solar power and so on. Well, you know, I mean, Americans are investing in solar power, but they're investing in it in China, not here. I'll give you some things on the hemp. Uh, See, well, it, it's just, it's really uh, promising, and plus you know, all the other products with that, too. Uh, well, the, one of the uh, uh, sectors of the science, science uh, community that's being cut back, by, that the Republicans want to cut back, is the uh, uh, funding for uh, uh, biotechnology, you know, uh, turning uh, cellulose into, you know, useless cellulose into usable fuel. They want to stop that. Right. Well, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, if the, 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 what happened in Japan, we can't afford any uh, more accidents like that. Right. When this was happening in Japan, uh, Obama authorized more nuclear plants, uh, yeah. went to Chile and uh, made a deal for nuclear energy. And then the disaster in the Gulf, and uh, they don't seem to be uh, that concerned about offshore drilling. And uh, it's just... Uh, it just amazes me. I remember that, that Hume stated uh, centuries ago that nothing appears uh, more surprising to those who consider human affairs with a philosophical eye than the easiness with which the many are governed by the few. So I mean, are you in agreement that most Americans are, are, are being misled here at the height of the information age? That's, that's what he said. He said uh, it's because of the power of what we call propaganda, you didn't call it that. But we have the internet now. I mean, we, that's our oh, yeah. tool. 
It's a tool, could be. but it could be. But I mean, the internet is only a tool if you know how to use it. Like for example, you could walk into the Harvard Library and learn tons of things if you know what you're looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's just chaos. Right. And the internet is just that magnified. There has to be some organization. It has to be organized, structured. Uh, you have to. This to be a framework that you develop, uh, and that comes out of. Uh, education and organization. Right. When individuals just go into the internet alone, they often end up with completely crazy views. There you don't, you be, don't know what to evaluate. Yeah. There has to be, yeah, it has to be organized. It has to be some kind of uh, community uh, organization along with the internet. But otherwise, they're going to try to take the internet away from us, and then we're not going to have that. They may not even take it away, because the point is it's, uh, it's just chaos as long as you have an atomized population. If they can take away organization, interaction, you know, talking to your neighbors and so on, that leave people isolated and alone, you can throw the internet at them and they can't do anything with it. Right, right. Hey, no, thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. It's always a pleasure.